Good morning. Good morning. It is uh, so good to have all of you with us today as we are continuing on in this sermon series uh, called Summer Soundtrack. But just before we do, my grade three, four teacher is right here, Mrs. Ridley. Let's honor Mrs. Ridley right now. (laughs) If you like my message, she gets the credit. If you don't, (laughs) it's Pastor Gary's fault. You know, I, I, was, I was just telling her, actually, just we were shaking hands. Uh, when we were young, um, they had a pond in their yard, and they had these, like, goldfish that... The thing is with goldfish, right, is they grow to, like, the size of your environment, right? So if you have a goldfish in a little tank, it's not going to get that big, but you put that in a bigger pond, they get bigger. So somehow, we got a fish out of her pond when I was young, And my dad taught me that when your fish die, that you flush them down the toilet. So so we got a fish from her pond, which is basically like a smallmouth bass, and it died eventually. So I did what just, what my dad taught me to do is you try to flush that thing down the toilet, and it didn't go well. Um, Had to call the plumbers in. (laughs) Do some work as I clogged the drains with a, with a large fish. Anyway, I honor you today. <laughs> Summer soundtrack. Summer soundtrack. We are in this series. If you're new or visiting, it's uh, really a series in the Psalms, uh, what we're doing, which is a book in the Old uh, Testament. Uh, we're looking at different Psalms here. The, 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 the book of Psalms is a very interesting book. It's a very unique book. It's a, it's a collection of 150 different songs, poems, and prayers. Uh, and what's really interesting about this book is many people have called it the Bible within the Bible. It's kind of like a little mini Bible. And there's many reasons why. The, the, the book of Psalms took several different authors to compile it all, just like the Bible did. The book of Psalms was written over a long period of time, just like the Bible was. The book of Psalms has many different literary genres in it, just like the Bible does. So what we're doing in this series is we're kind of looking at those different literary genres, the the different categories of Psalms. Uh, Last week, as we started this series, we looked at the first category, which we just called Psalms of Praise. Uh, there, there's many of them. All these psalms that are, uh, by design, cause uh, the, the reader to, it kind of like invokes worship in us. It, it draws that out. So that was last week's psalms of praise. This week, if you're taking notes, we're going to look at uh, something a little different. We're going to look at psalms of petition. Psalms of petition. Uh, anybody here, have you ever been asked to sign a petition? Yeah, if you live in Windsor, the answer is probably yes. I, I don't know. I feel like petitions go out all the time, and usually they're directed uh, towards whether it's like our municipal government, our federal government, school boards. But, but kind of the idea, right, is that if you get enough people to sign the petition, then it will get read in the audience of the people that you want to hear it. Your request, whatever that is, will be heard. Now listen, in the same way that you, we can petition to have a voice with our government, the reality is we can also petition to have a voice with God. Except it's better than our government. Because when it comes to God, you don't need to write it down on paper. Although that's not wrong. I'm saying that you don't need that. And also, you don't need to get a whole bunch of people on board to have your request brought before the Lord. All he wants is you. All he wants is you to present your request to him. And so in the book of Psalms, there are several psalms of petitions, psalms of request. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at one of these today. Uh, if you have a Bible, let's go. Open it up to Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51. This is where we're going to be for the next little bit. And what's fascinating about this psalm is that we know the exact context of this psalm. Like, there's many psalms that are beautiful, well-written, awesome psalms, but we don't know why they were written. This one we do, because it actually starts with a heading right above it that says this. It says, for the director of music, 
a psalm of David. So it's David who wrote this psalm for the director of music. And then he said this, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So that's the context. David wrote this psalm after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Now, if you were with us over the last couple months, we just came out of a series called Dave, where we were focusing on the life of David, the guy who wrote this psalm. And we took an entire week out to look at the story of David and Bathsheba. But if you missed it or if you're new, I'm going to make sure that we're all up to speed because it is the context of everything we're going to read today. So David is the king of Israel. And one day uh, he was out walking on his rooftop at night. He looks down and he sees a woman by the name of Bathsheba bathing naked. He lusts after her. And then what he does is he brings in one of his officials to try to figure out who she is. The official figures it out, comes back to David and says, oh, this is Bathsheba. She's married to Uriah. Uriah is off fighting your battle right now. So David says, oh, this is awesome. I can capitalize on the situation. So he forces Bathsheba into the palace. He sleeps with her. And then he finds out after sleeping with her that he impregnated her. Like the situation's just getting bad. When David finds out that she's pregnant, he comes up with a lot of schemes to try to figure out how to hide this, how to make sure that no one knows that the baby was his. All of those plans fail. And then eventually he gets to the spot and says, all right, here's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to murder Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. I'll take her as my wife, and then everyone will think the baby was mine, and we conceived on the honeymoon. It's like just, it spirals in a negative way. This actually happens. David murders Bathsheba's husband, takes her as his wife, and everyone for at least a moment thought the baby was rightfully his. That it, this wasn't committed in an adulterous act. That, like he, For a moment, it seemed like David had actually gotten away with it. Uriah's out of the picture, People think that that Bathsheba got pregnant on the honeymoon, and he even gets some good PR out of it, right? Because he's caring for the family of a fallen soldier. All of a sudden, he thinks, this is over. I can move on. I've gotten away. Here's the problem. Even though sometimes we have the ability to fool everyone else around us, you know who we don't have the ability to fool? God. He sees everything. And what happens, this is the heading of this entire psalm. It says that the prophet Nathan, and we read about this in 2 Samuel, the prophet Nathan comes to David and outs him in his sin. Like, like God, the creator of the universe... <laughs> speaks to the prophet Nathan, hones in on David's sin and says, you need to go talk to him. And this is what happens. The prophet comes and exposes every single thing that David did. Every single thing is laid bare. And as a result of this, David writes Psalm 51, a psalm of petition. Okay? Now, in this psalm, there's kind of three different categories, and we're going to look at all three of them because they're going to help us. Okay? If you're taking notes, uh, you can write this down. Everyone else, just repeat after me. Say remorse. remorse. This is the first section of the psalm. David starts off just feeling a deep sense of remorse and regret over what he's done. Here we go. Verse 1. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge." Parkwood, this is what remorse looks like. And and I want you to see how personal this is for David. Like, he says, have mercy on me. 
Blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for it's my transgressions and my sins are always before me. Right? This is intensely personal. He is filled with just deep remorse over his sin. David here is not minimizing or deflecting in any way. You notice that he doesn't start by saying, well, no one knows how hard it is to be king. And no one really cares about my... No, he's not making excuses he, at all. He's, he's, he's saying, like, listen, like, there, there's no excuses. This is on me. I did it. I slept with Bathsheba. I made the decision to bring her into my courts. I murdered Uriah. It's on me. And then there's, and then the, the, there's the petition where he just says, have mercy on me, oh God. Remorse. Remorse. It, 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 is, it is fundamental in our, in our processing here. And then there's this fascinating line in verse 4. You see it in verse 4? He says to God, against you and you only have I sinned. Okay. <laughs> Who among us doesn't think, well... <laughs> Yeah, you sinned against God, but David, man, like you basically raped Bathsheba and murdered her husband. How about them? So the question, Parkwood, is David minimizing what he did to them? Is, is, is David saying, well, well, those things weren't really that big of a deal? Absolutely not. You have to keep in mind, this is Hebrew poetry, and oftentimes what happens in Hebrew poetry is the authors will use what's called hyperbolic language to make a point. And the point that David is making right here is that as bad as his sins were against Bathsheba and Uriah, they were worse against God. And in so doing, David actually teaches us here a very fundamental thing about our sin, and it's the vertical relationship, the vertical impact. Like, like hear me. Um, Okay, listen, this is just going to be one of those messages. Pastor Mark Hazard used to say, like, put your seatbelts on. Like, just buckle up, okay? Uh, today we're, we're talking about sin. <laughs> um, our sin horizontally, person to person, like, it's bad. Like, it is really, really bad. Like, like we can just wreak devastation. It is bad. But, but as bad as it is, person to person, horizontally, vertically, it pales in comparison to how wicked our sins are before the Lord. David knows this. This is why he writes this. This is why David is filled with so much regret and remorse over his actions. In fact, go down to verse 17 in this psalm. Look, look what David writes. He, he says this, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, you, God, will not despise. So I want you to hear me. I'm not talking about shame. The Lord does not want us to live in shame, but it is right for us to be broken over our sin. It is right for us to feel a deep sense of regret and remorse when we miss the mark, when we do things we know we shouldn't do and we don't do the things that we know that we should do. That's sin. We should feel remorse. We should feel broken. And I know right now somebody's thinking out there, man, I can't believe my neighbor's not here today. They need to hear this message. <laughs> he needs to hear this. She needs to hear this. Friend, can I help you? Okay? Stop it. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that they're not here and you are? <laughs> Maybe. I'm just going to go out on a limb. Maybe this morning, God actually wants to talk to you about your sin and not the sin of somebody else. Maybe. David sins. In his, his first section of this psalm as a regret, he's, he's filled with a rightful sense 
of remorse over his actions, but it doesn't stay there, okay? He moves on into the second section, which is called renewal. Let me hear you say renewal. renewal. He moves from remorse to renewal. Now, this is a vital section. This is a vital stage. You see, David here is not just content with being remorseful over his actions. He's not even just content in God forgiving him of his actions. He wants God to change him from the inside out so much so that he's never going to do it again. Like, like where David's mind goes, he's saying, like, I, I, I don't want to murder again. I don't want to sleep with another man's wife again. I don't want to be that guy. So God, I need you to fix me. I, I, I need you to renew me from the inside out. This is the progression of his petition. Look at verse 10. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. <laughs> Renewal. You, you want to know what I find fascinating about this psalm? There's nothing in it about sex, adultery. Uh, there's nothing in this uh, about lust. Like, that, that doesn't even manifest itself. And you say, well, pastor, wasn't that the issue? No. It wasn't the issue. The, the, the issue of David's life here was not lust. <laughs> it was an absence of the joy of his salvation. That's why he writes right here, give me more joy, renew my joy, restore unto me the joy that is only found in you because when that joy fades, I do really dumb things. Like it, was, it was John Piper who, who said that every sin on the outside is symptomatic of the absence of this joy. Parkwood, our heart hearts are thirsty. Our souls are hungry. And you better believe that if we're not eating and drinking from Jesus, that we will eat and drink from somewhere else. David knows the issue. David doesn't say, he doesn't even deal with the symptoms. He wants to get down to the disease. He wants to get down to the core of the problem. And he says, there's something wrong inside of me. And that's what's causing all these other things on the outside of me. But there's something wrong in here. So he says, I'm not just broken over my sin. God, don't just forgive me of my sins. He said, God, I need you to create in me a new heart. God, I need you to fix what's going on inside of me. God, I need you to restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Remorse moves into renewal. Listen, Parkwood, I, I've said this numerous times before, and I'll say it numerous times before I leave. God is more concerned in doing a work in us than he is through us. And I just want you to think about that for a moment. God is infinitely more concerned in doing a work in you than he is through you. To God, your character matters more than your career. To God, your character matters more than your charisma. To who you are, matters more than what you do. You with me? So David, da David says, right? Like, like God, I, I need you to break me. God, I, I, I feel terrible over this. Forgive me, cleanse me, wash me. And then he moves into this and he says, all right, then I need you to create in me something new. I need a, a new spirit within me. I need you to restore unto me the joy. Do it inside of me. This is the second section of his petition. And then he moves on to the third. It goes from remorse into renewal and renewal now into revival. Let me hear you say revival. 
This is the third section. David is not just content in being broken over his sin or even having God do the inward transformation on him in his character, his integrity. What he wants is to see God get glory. Sinners come to repentance through him. Look at verse 13. He says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn uh, so, yeah, we'll turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You see? You see it? Remorse into renewal, renewal into revival. In verse 13, it starts with the word then, and I love it because the word, the word then tells us when. When does revival come? After I've repented of my sin and allowed God to create the new spirit inside of me by the power of his Holy Spirit, then, then I'm going to teach transgressors your way. Then I'm going to start showing sinners your love. Then I'm going to let them know about the gospel that saves remorse into renewal, renewal into revival. See it. The progression matters. The progression matters. Listen, we're, we're, we're going to sing a song in, in just a few minutes. In fact, worship team, assemble. I, I don't know. How to call you back up. <laughs> it's a simple, it's a simple message this morning, but it's one that I think we all need to hear. Hmm. Revival. Um, a number of years ago, it was in the middle of summer, and our doorbell rung, and I went and answered the door. And there's this 15, 16 year old uh, guy on the other side of the door, and he was selling meat. He didn't have like a cooler of meat, <laughs> he had a catalog of meat, and you could order like right from the butcher. And um, meat is just one of those things that I, I know a fair bit about. I actually mentioned last week, I, I worked at the keg uh, cooking meat for five years. And so I know about the different cuts and the different sections, and I know the good meat from the bad meat. And so I promise you, I wasn't trying to, like, mess with this 16-year-old. I was legitimately interested in what he was trying to sell me. And so I'm asking questions about where, uh, what, what cuts they have. This 16-year-old knew nothing. He kept going back to his catalog. Well, he's flipping around. At one point, he pulled out a cue card... <laughs> And he started reading off the cue card. And, and, I, and I looked at him, and I just, I just said, man, like, just, I said, just be real with me. I said, have you eaten the meat? <laughs> like, have you actually tasted of the thing that you're trying to sell me? And he said, no. He said, I'm just trying to make some money. <laughs> it was the worst sales pitch <laughs> I've ever experienced in my life. <laughs> He didn't even know the product that he was talking about. And I kind of walked away from that experience thinking, man, if that doesn't sometimes, that isn't a picture of sometimes what happens to us. Like, maybe, maybe one of the reasons why we struggle talking to other people about Jesus is because we haven't really tasted of Jesus. M maybe, or, 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 or maybe you have, but it's been a really long time and you forget what God's like and you forget about his goodness and you forget about his mercy and you forget about his presence. It's been so long since you've been there and now you find yourself in this spot and it's like, well, I don't even have the desire to reach other people and it's because there might be something lacking in your relationship with Christ. I used to teach a, um, I used to teach a course here called The Mission of God. 
Uh, I taught it for about five years when I was the missions pastor here and hundreds of people probably in this room took that course and we would talk about so many specific things, the art of neighboring. We'd talk about what it looks like. How do you reach your neighbors? We'd, all these things, but they were good things. But fundamentally, underneath all of that stuff is this. If you are not experiencing Jesus, you will always have a hard time sharing Jesus. Always. It's like you're rolling up to people's doors for the catalog. <laughs> but you've never experienced him yourself. Like, see this here. David petitions God, have mercy on me, wash me, cleanse me, create in me a new heart, renew a right spirit with me, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Then, then I can go. Then I'll love. Then I'll speak. Then I'll open up my mouth. But God, you have to do something in me first. God, you have to move in me first. You, you have to restore your, the joy of salvation in me first. God, I need you. David here is coming out of possibly the weakest moment of his life. Lust, adultery, murder. And he says, God, I need you in here so that I can reach people out there. God, I need you to break me. Lord, I need you to fill me so that God, you can send me. This is my petition, Lord. And so my question to you, can we stand up all across this room? Here's my question. So when we look at these, remorse, renewal, revival, remorse, renewal, revival, obviously God wants us in all of this. God wants us to feel broken over our sin. That is right. That is good. And it says that brokenness that leads us to renewal. It is right for us, desire for the joy of our salvation to come in. Absolutely. And it's right for us to want to win people to Jesus, for Jesus. These are all good things, but I just want to ask the question this morning, where, like if we can just have a moment of honesty, like where might you be lacking this morning? Maybe it's remorse. Maybe Maybe you find yourself in a position right now, and if you're honest, you don't feel bad about your sin, or you don't feel nearly as remorseful as maybe you once did. And brother, sister, if that is you this morning, then I love you enough to tell you that what you need to do is you need to petition the Lord today. God, break me in the same way that you broke David. God, break me because this callousness to my sin is not right. <laughs> so this is the petition. God, break me. Maybe, maybe where you're lacking right now is just renewal. It's, it's, it's like you, you still feel bad over your sin, but it's the joy of Christ that is just not there. Your joy in Jesus is lacking. And maybe your petition is not necessarily break me, but maybe the petition this morning is, God, I need you to fill me. I need you to fill me. As David wrote, take not your Holy Spirit from me. God, I need you, Holy Spirit, to fill that emptiness inside of me. I need you, Holy Spirit, to renew everything that's wrong. I need you to restore to me the joy of your salvation. Or maybe the petition is in the area of revival. It's just you lost that desire. <laughs> you lost that thing that drives you. You're, you don't feel emboldened about Christ. You struggle sharing Jesus in the workplace or with your neighbors. Maybe it's not break me. Maybe it's not fill me. Maybe your petition this morning is, God, I need you to send me again. 
I need to hear your words speaking to my life this morning. God, I need you. I, I want you to send me. I need you to embolden me. This is the petition of David. I was reading it this week. I was like, man, it could not speak to our church more than anything. I, I had somebody say to me a while back, they said, Danny, man, I love Park, but I love so many things about it. But the problem is you, you talk about sin and I don't like showing up and people are just going to talk about sin. And then once you talk about sin, then I feel bad about myself. It's like, okay, you should. <laughs> that is a right thing. I'm not saying shame, okay? But we should feel broken over our sin. It's the brokenness that leads to the renewal. It's the renewal that leads to the revival. This is the progression. And so we're going to sing a song. It's called, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. God, I need you now. And so as we sing this song, here's what I, here's what I want to call upon you, church. As we sing this, whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your life right now, use this song as a petition. When we sing out, Lord, I need you, it's, Lord, I need you right now. Break me. Break me. Lord, I need you right now. Fill me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Lord, I need you right now. Send me. Embolden me. Equip me. Lord, I need you. And so today, church, may we, in this moment, may we petition the Lord. May we not just read these ancient words, but may they come to, lie, to, to life and inspire us. As we talked before, these prayers are like incense in the throne room of God. He hears, he smells, he experiences this moment right now now. So let's not lose it. Let's not waste it. But let us, like David, petition the Lord. If you need him, cry out to him. Whatever you need, he is available right now.